So this, this year had kind a of phenomenal uh, woman in the lobstream exhibit, an art exhibit. Um, and so it got us thinking about who are the women in the fisheries? And so while men caught the fish, women were at home processing the fish and in the, in the factories also. And the regulations and changes in taste have altered the fish processing in Maine for over the past century and a half. So today we have a panel of historians and a smokehouse owner who's going to tell us how women fuel the industry. We'll start with Jill Whitchurch Dixon, who came and did research in our archives, looking at examples of women in the fisheries, either out on the boats, at home, or in the factories. Um, she's earned her master's in American history from Norwich University, and her capstone research focused on the importance of women's work on coastal Maine from 1870 to 1830. Hi, everybody. We're just going to talk about history for a little bit. Um, and I just want to say I'm really happy to be here today. Um, my, I have, I'm basically a stay-at-home mom with three kids. One is a toddler. She's really happy. And this is a vacation for me to just like sit in a chair and not have to chase the toddler. But, um, anyways, so, Basically, women in Maine provided the backbone to seafood processing throughout history. Originally, Native American women processed and prepared fish um, by smoking and preserving it um, for the winter months. Um, and then later, when you had um, Maine was settled by Europeans um, and industrialized, uh, by the mid-1800s, women bolstered the fish processing industry in three major ways. Um, the most um, obvious way is through the canning industry. Um, number one, number two is through or was through um, smokehouses, and third way was the cottage industry of crab picking. Um, there were lots and lots of ways that women supported the economy in coastal towns and Maine, um, but these are the main ways that they were directly tied to processing. So um, the first canning. So here we have just have the. Um, a label for lobster. Um, canneries sprang up in Maine around the 1840s um, with the, the can, the new technology of uh, being able to can um, coincided with a new demand for lobsters in the big cities uh, like New York and Boston. Lobster had to be shipped live, so to be able to can them was a really, really big deal, um, and it just took off. Um, this is a cannery in Robinston, Maine. Um, so men and women both worked in the factories. Men uh, did a lot of loading. They were called choppers, basically cut up the fish. Um, they did managing, management, like foremen, um, drivers, that kind of thing. Women were um, the canners, so they had small hands and they could work quickly. So they cleaned and they packed um, they sealed the cans. Then, um, let's see. According to the Annual Report of Labor and Industry in 1900, there were 152 seafood canneries in Maine. Um, workers included 1,386 men, 911 women, and 265 children. Um, this may or may not have been accurate. Um, due to just the seasonal nature of work. The, in the 1870s, um, lobster numbers declined. New regulations caused lobster canneries to move to Canada um, by the late 1800s. Uh, George Brown Goods Compendium on Fisheries from 1884 to 87 um, spoke about lobster canneries. Uh, he talked about picking meat off of lobster claws, um, washing meat, filling the cans. Um, it was all done by in quotation marks, curls, um, with astonishing rapidity. Um, he didn't know if the girls, uh, or he noted that the girls were paid less than the men, but he didn't say exactly what the pay was or the age of the girls. Um, and we know definitely in the sardine industry that the women were all different ages. 
uh, from very young girls, even like five years old, to um, older women. And let's see the next slides. So this is in the Robinson. In Robinson. Um, these are cottages for the cannery workers put up by the cannery. Um, this is in, I actually don't have a date for this. Um, in the um, Calais area, there were 20 odd canneries at Sardines in 1905. So there were hundreds of workers that were housed in these um, cottages or shanties. Um, but yeah, so the workers had to pay rent for these and then uh, usually stayed seasonally. Um, this was in Eastport and it was more of a family unit.
to show this picture because um, we get an image of her fingers up close and what hard work it was and we don't know if her fingers are bandaged from injuries she already has or she's just protecting them from cuts or bacteria.
So car picking was a home cottage industry. Um, I did my uh, started my project online uh, as we were moving. We moved a year ago from the Portland, Oregon area back to Maine. Um, it took me eight years to convince my husband to move back to Maine, but I did it. And um, we had at the time our baby was like two months old, and we were moving. And then I came upon all of these crab picking um, interviews that were done by uh, Blossom Kravitz, a historian. Um, actually, she might have been an anthropologist, but she um, and it, she did uh, a lot of these interviews with folks from Little Deer Isle in a nursing home, and um, many of them learned how to crab pick from their grandmothers. So this is just happening forever and I was so excited when I found out about it because so I was like, I'm going to use a and I'm going to pick crabs. It's perfect because you have a baby, you put the baby up for a nap, you're like, you're your crab, you're, you know, you cook them and then you can pick them. Like, it was my, I don't know, it's not really realistic, um, especially if you live in them. The, um, the idea is it's a cottage industry and it works perfectly to go along with anybody, you know, with your, your flexible schedule to have women at home and they're farming.
Next we have Leslie Harley. So Leslie Harlow owns Sullivan Harbor Farm Smokehouse, specializing in cold smoked salmon. She started the business in 1992. involved, 
and when you hand cure a fish, you basically take the fillet and you rub salt, a little teeny bit of brown sugar on it, and then you cure it for anywhere from six and a half to nine hours. FTA rules are a minimum of seven and a half hours, but at the time, like I said, things were still a little like you could kind of do what you want. And then what we would do is we would cure the fish and then we would do them in AFOS kilns, which are um, kind of old world kilns, stainless, but at one end of them, the kiln's about 12 feet long, there are three drawers uh, where we have sludge fires of hickory and apple wood. And then there's a fan on the end, other end of the kiln, draws the air through, and basically is smoking, which is a flavor, it's not a preservative, it's a flavor, but it's also um, taking water out of the fish. So our signature trademark then and now, and I'll lead to our now story too, because it's kind of a little bit of a, became a battleground, but it's really about getting the right smoke, the right amount of salt, and having the right amount of oils remaining in the fish. Um, so we did that all through the 90s, and we sold to Legal Seafood, who are their prime supplier, uh, Ritz Carlton, Four Seasons, uh, Dan DeLuca, Martha Stewart, so top, you name it. We were kind of in everybody's catalog, and we, you know, a lot of this was before the internet. So we, were, we worked directly with these companies and had a really good run. And about 1998, so we did that for about six years, and my my now former husband, he's, he's kind of a bully guy, and he doesn't like rules. So all of a sudden one day, this truck pulls up in our driveway, and it says FDA. We didn't even drive the hands then, it was a truck. <laughs> and I'm like, whoa, what is this? And this guy gets out, he's in uniform, that didn't help. At least with my former husband. And um, anyway, the guy's there, and he hands us this, this little book that had, we just counted the other day, had 38 pages, and it was the fisheries guide. And it was the fisheries guide for all the fisheries. It wasn't broken down into the different fisheries. It was for all the fisheries. And it was things like these terms called critical control points. And then you had to have like general manufacturing practices and SOP, which is standard operating procedure. We're both smart people. You know, I'm a college dropout, I'm not stupid. But let me tell you, we stood there and looked at that book and had one of those what the F moments. Because it's like, are we, what are we supposed to do with this now? So, anyway, so we basically operated for six or seven years with absolutely no oversight from anybody. Um, we, we are very sanitary, we're very sanitary oriented. We don't cleanliness, we had all sorts of state-of-the-art slicing equipment and kilns and all this jazz. But somebody was going to tell us we had to do that, which, you know, it's a shocking. And uh, the only guy we ever saw for all those years was a guy from the state of Maine who came in with his thermometer to make sure the water was 140 degrees. And he'd go, what is it you guys are doing here? And we'd hand it eight ounce pack of smoked salmon and he'd leave and he'd go, man, this stuff's really, really good. Thanks, thanks. And then, but that was it. That was it. So the early 2000s came, and it was clear, like, we had to really get it together with this hassle thing. And at the time, you know, you could go to the University of Maine, which you certainly do, there was all of a sudden this new industry of consultants out there. And so all of a sudden, they're knocking on our door. And we still didn't really get it. And, you know, we talked to other friends of ours, you know, like craft workers or whatever, and everybody's like, you know, what is this? Because nobody ever really told you what it was. <laughs> HACCP. I'm sure people in this room know HACCP. I know it's Steve does. Hazard Analysis Critical Control Points. Only the government could come up with that, okay? It's really food safety. But anyway, we had to learn the stuff. And it's science. Now here we were as people that just, you know, we're like into food. You know, with this, like we've got this sort of smokehouse thing going. You know, we got people seafood who love stuff. You know, we just we're like this little guy just wanting to make good food. And we were, had become very well known around the country. And uh, by now we won some pretty prestigious awards in the, in the uh, uh, specialty food world. Cooks Illustrated gave us 
number one. Consumer Reports rated us number one for mail order. You know, it's like chug, chug, chug going forward. So we decided we, what we needed to do is build a new building. Because the only way we were really going to be able to do HASA was to have a facility that was going to revolve around refrigeration, freezing, water, air temperature, everything that was now required in this new world war. So we did. We, it, we, went, we went over to Hancock, two miles away, and we made a huge investment and built ourselves a custom building. The smokehouse is there today, and if you've ever been over one up that way, you're probably familiar with the property. And um, so we got going, and then I woke up and realized I was miserable in this relationship with this human being. And so I parted, we parted ways. And for the next 10 years, I went off. I lived in Ellsworth now. And I opened a little cafe. And I've just always been in food, restaurants, stuff like that. So I had my whole thing going. Well, in the meantime, I'm kind of watching the smokehouse thing go on. And I had a somewhat acrimonious relationship with my former husband. But it started to improve because he was starting to feel really overloaded with this these regulations, and it, 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 he's older, and it was just getting to be too much. And finally, one day in the fall of 2015, a very thick envelope arrived on his desk from the Department of Justice, and it was a consent decree, which if anybody knows what those are, it's when the government sues you, and you didn't follow the rules. And what had happened was, for a number of years, the FDA would come and do their annual inspection, and they'd say, well, you need to do this, and you need to do this. And he'd go, yeah, 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 I'll get it done, I'll get it done. Well, they would come back the next year, and it was all minor stuff. But he didn't follow the rules. So basically, he did a voluntary um, shutdown of the business and turned to me. Actually, he called me for lunch, and he said, let's go out to lunch. And I'm kind of like, really? Why do I have to go out to lunch? Anyway, I met him for lunch. He ordered a martini. And I knew it was going to be bad. I just knew. <laughs> you know, I'm not a drinker, and he isn't much of one. The martini arrived. He took this big, fat FedEx envelope out, put it on the table, and just said, I don't know what this is. And all I did was see the Department of Justice on it. And I was like, you know, maybe this is not a good thing. So from that point on, um, we had a big legal problem. I, I no longer had any uh, uh, financial interest in the business. but. But we agreed over a period of several months that I would take the business back over. And you know, I had like 17 years of, you know, I I smoked fish, I cleaned fish, I packed fish, I picked fish up at the fish farm, and you name it, I did it. So I kind of like, no problem. Well, that was a very, I was extremely delusional. And I admit it at this point. So it took three years of basically working with the FDA to rebuild the business so that we could open. And what we did was we, um, you know, I, I, I did a deep dive right at the very beginning and so financially, and so I just went, okay, there is no turning back. But I had several times during the course of events where I was just like, I, I just can't do this anymore. Because when you get in trouble with the feds, there really, there really aren't too many places to find the light of day. And uh, I think maybe because I'm a woman, maybe because I'm a mother, maybe because I have a son who's in Iraq, in the Marines, I don't know what it was, but I just kept plugging along. And um, so last fall, we got a letter from the FDA, my lawyer did, and they said, hey, we're going to come do the inspection now. You know, as soon as we inspect, um, as long as everything goes well, we'll be able to reopen. So we're all excited. I, I have staff and employees that I've been paying and doing every imaginable thing to, to create revenue for the business over those couple of years. And the uh, Fed showed up on December 15th. They were there for three days. The first hour, it was painful. But by day three, the, the inspector gave us a big hug and wished us a lot of luck and told us we're going to be great, ready to go. And then the government shut down. That. And, and so for 69 days, um, the government shutdown was only like 42, but it was another 22 days 
for the, the FDA to kind of get their act together and do our paperwork. So finally, on Valentine's Day, my lawyer called me and she said, go to the bank, get a bank check, $5,000, because I had to make an inspection, and uh, you know, blah, 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 send it, and you'll get a letter and you'll be able to, to go back into production. So um, I did it, and I even have a picture of myself at the bank, you know, like getting the bank check, and the, the, um, the woman, the cashier who knew me said, uh, she said, is there anything that you want to say on the memo? And I had to stay in there for a minute, and I won't say what I said, but it was <laughs> And you, I know, but we didn't put that on it. But it was kind of like, I couldn't believe that we actually had this day. I had to be the only person in America that was happy to give me a check for the federal government for $5,000. So anyway, so, um, so what's happened since all that, we've been in production since really, like, full-heartedly, kind of the beginning of June. And I had a young woman who is uh, in the area who I basically cultivated to be our master smoker. And she has taken on this with a great deal of, um, she's very eager, and she has a lot of intuition. So she's very comfortable in the role. And I actually was talking to Nancy Jenkins and Meredith Go down at the uh, portal paper about it, because I'd like to really use this young woman as a real example of jobs in the fisheries in Maine that can be really interesting and aren't necessarily just working, not just, but you know, working on a lobster boat and doing the oyster business. There's, there's other spin-off type of things that other type of jobs that uh, people can do. Um, so I'm excited about that. And also, what's very interesting for me, I, I own a restaurant as well, and so all summer, every evening, I'm the person in the front door, so when you come in, I greet you, I see you, you know, do the jibber-jabber and the whole bit. And the other night, it's the first night I really had off since we really went to full guns back in June. So I, because of all this going on in Washington, of course I have to turn on television. So what blew me away were these ads that Whole Foods had. And the ads are basically supporting agriculture. And they're very good ads, and they're, they're clearly paving the way now for the theme that agriculture done responsibly is, is not a bad thing. We have to go eat fish. We, I think most of us in this room understand that we have to support clean, responsible agriculture. And um, I'm, I'm quite uh, proud, in fact, now that the source that we're using right now for our salmon has been certified by Seafood Watch, which is through the Monterey Aquarium in California, and they have a whole program to, um, for stewardship for responsible, sustainable methods for raising fish, eating fish, um, and processing the fish. So I'm feeling, you know, I've been doing this for 30 years, almost 30 years, and, you know, we went through a really tough time pretty much from about 1996 or so, really for about 13 or 14 years where the industry, especially with salmon, has been, I think I've just got a bad rap in terms of, uh, you know, for people who are anti agriculture people. But I think the tides are turning, and a lot of these companies have become very responsible feeding techniques, what they're feeding it. There's a lot of different levels of fish that you can buy. But being a main company and feeling very strong about the main brand, um, it's, it's, we're very proud that our fish comes from the Bay of Fundy. Our fish has never been on an airplane. You know, I think that's kind of, no, no, no Trap can't say that. It all comes from Chile. And ground trading, a lot of their stuff's coming from Scotland. And so I feel for us, like our kind of footprint re-emerging and kind of coming back into the main market, um, where now there's a lot of salmon eaten in Maine, which many years ago wasn't that much consumed because it's, it's an expensive protein source. 
So I'm very excited about what the future brings for my business. Um, we have a huge uphill battle, but I already went through one, and you know we're open, and that was humongous. So uh, so anyway, I'm looking forward to a bright future, and you know it's neither of my kids are really interested in this particular business, but one of my children actually just bought an oyster farm over in Sorrento, right nearby. Yeah, so you know, I'm pretty excited because he and I have been teaming up with some ideas and uh, doing some different things and also incorporating into the restaurant I have. So that's our story. I'm happy to answer any questions. Yeah? For the control, rather than control, on all of the, the secret packing, are you comfortable that it's appropriate? Yes, we. And I brought one of these. This, this is this is a bag. It's sealed on one end. It's opened on this end. We do vacuum packing. It's safe, and it keeps this fish like once it goes into this bag, it's good for about thirty days. And if that's what you're asking me. Okay. When we started selling up here, the only way you got crab is if you got a lobster and then bring it in for you because he was throwing it back unless his wife was picking it at home. Mm -hmm. And Lord knows how it got sold. Um, now, clearly, they're packing this stuff. Oh, so you're talking more about food safety. It was broadly, do you feel that you're overly, over regulated? Yes. I, I think after well, the fact that it took three years for us to get through this was ridiculous. Um, yes, like I came across something recently that was a little troubling. Um, if you guys are into processing at all, you know the blue glove is like the thing. You got to wear the blue glove, right? And you got to take the glove off. Like we just had our compliance guy do his review at my place this past week, and he's a really good guy. He's like on our side. But I mean, we're talking about like. You know, I went through like so many gloves. You can't use, oh no, Leslie, if you're gonna go touch this, you have to put a new set of gloves on. Okay. However, I learned last summer that there is a trade organization called the National Safety Glove Council. <laughs> <laughs> and they spend six million dollars lobbying for, with the FDA and the USDA. So it's like, I, I think, unfortunately, some of this stuff isn't really about regulation as much as it is about you as a manufacturer having to buy the stuff because the regulators have told you, because they got the regulators to believe that it's part of the food safety. Um, but I do feel that, I mean, sanitation and cleanliness, it's so important. It's so important. Yeah. Yeah. As you, as you went through the process, did you come over uh, points within your own uh, systems that you said, oh, geez, we weren't even thinking Absolutely. about Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So it did bear some, some improvement results? No, there was. And, and one of the problems that the business had, like I said, my, my former husband is quite a bit older than I am, so he was kind of this old school guy. So for him, the idea, None of, there was no logic to him with a lot of it, but yes, we we did look at it. Gave, it made me have the opportunity to really look at what we were doing, and yes, that some of the stuff's really okay. <laughs> a good idea. I'm wondering if um, uh, small processors like yourself have uh, joined forces with some of the people in the uh, small dairy business or small meat growers who have been doing uh, food sovereignty work in Maine to keep uh, small processors open because there was a period of time that they got shut down and, um, you know, if, if I as an individual was raising a pig or some chickens, I oftentimes uh, had to make an appointment a, a year in advance to find a place that could actually mm -hmm. take care of my animal because all the little people had been shut down. Is the uh, our processors of seafood part of that movement of small producers 
Well, I, I can't really speak for other people. I know I've been so busy the last five months just, I mean, like literally yeah. taking out the trash, right? Yeah. Um, but I have a very strong view that what I think is very unfortunate is that if somebody is a young person, you need a lot of money to get going in this stuff. And I'm just old enough, like I'm 65, and I've done, I, you know, back in the day, I mean, my friends and I went to a restaurant, we had $10,000. That included buying the building in Bar Harbor. You know, that, <laughs> so, I mean, no, I mean, it's even like harder. He said, you take inflation into account, everything, you just go, really? Like that really happened? But, um, but where I am very interested in getting involved is when I was at the Boston Seafood Show back in March, I went up to the uh, FDA booth, and you know, I'm kind of like this. <laughs> I'm sort of a fly, right? And so, um, of course, every, all these, because they're all New England guys, they all kind of knew who we were, but we're supportive of us trying to get reopened. But there was a guy in a suit there, so I went over to the guy in the suit, and it turned out that he is head of seafood for the FDA. So, he, and what I spoke to him about was, I want to be on an advisory committee. And he really heard me, and he and I had some communication. Because my thing with him was, how can a little guy even think about this stuff? And, and putting sovereignty and all that aside, just, you know, you need a half a million bucks. Like, if you want to open a smokehouse today, you need minimum of a half a million dollars. And that's just to get the door open. That doesn't include your first year of payroll, you know, operating expenses. So, um, but I do have a really good relationship with a lot of smaller food manufacturers here in Maine. And I'm beginning to think we need to have some, something. I don't know what it is. And I don't want to be the one to have to invent it because I'm too busy. But there is a need. Because, like, the cheese, people want the cheese deal. The dairy people, everybody has their 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 spots where as a trade they can get involved, but I do think there could be stuff. I'm hopeful of Jan Bill's is on this. I mean she, they seem quite receptive and understanding what it means to be the little guy. So yes. So you mentioned that uh, you get diligence about where your salmon was from, because you and I know that not all farm salmon is created. There's some really good actors and there's some laggards out there. So when you think about the future, I saw your package just says salmon. Um, is it in your business plan or your idea to mention Monterey, but like for example, to sort of only carry like farm salmon that as meets the highest sustainability standards, like maybe like True North brand or um, Lock Door from, from mm -hmm. Scotland, which is an organic brand. Um, do you think that means anything to your business or your, your customers right now, or is it just salmon? I, it means a lot to the customer. And they are seeing us as a steward. Like, they're, they're going to buy my salmon because they feel that we've been responsible to find the salmon that they should eat. Because there is salmon out there I'm not going to buy. Definitely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The, well, that's why I, we will not buy Chilean salmon. Yeah. Yeah. And, and also the Alaskan salmon thing, you know, the wild Alaskan salmon. I don't want to get into it, and I don't want to create any ripples, not here, but in general. But what wild Alaskan salmon, you know, people have this vision that they're like little grandmothers down by Bristol Bay, and they're out there, and their grandchildren are all kind of, you know, maybe on a boat getting salmon. And it's a huge, massive industry. And it's not, by the time we go to use it, it's not, it's, it's been frozen. Because, you know, they only have like six weeks or so to harvest salmon in Alaska. And then it gets frozen, and then it gets thawed, and then it gets, and then it gets frozen again. So it's altered that fish quite a bit. And, um, yeah, so. Anybody else? Yes, no. Oh, yeah. So, um, I'm interested in the jobs available and how far this could go. If, if Atlantic salmon farming uh, is going to grow in Maine, you mentioned like a master smoker and other. Um, could you imagine there being other small businesses like you? 
the, uh, and jobs in the value chain? I would like to think so. I know when we opened, there were about a dozen small smokehouses in Maine. And even at that time, Duck Trap was still a small smokehouse before they got really big. Um, so there, there was, but the has to kick a lot of these guys out. Like they just didn't want to do it or couldn't do it. Um, but I think Maine has an opportunity within the culinary world of thinking about not just creating culinary programs where we're going to create people for the restaurant food industry, but for small food production, seafood being one of them. Well, you're not going to see ours. We're not going to do it. It's, it's very, first of all, an oyster has to be cooked before you smoke it, and we're not going in the smoked oyster business. Yeah, yeah. But we did just this week, I mean, some other products we do, we just this week finished our HACCP and our validations for smoked mussels. And I call smoked mussels the potato chip of seafood because there isn't anybody who doesn't like a smoked mussel. They might not like smoked salmon, but the smoked mussel will be. And then we're going to um, reintroduce Arctic char, Icelandic Arctic char, and we'll be doing hot smoked salmon. And this past couple weeks, I've been down to Portland a couple times, so Harbor Fish is going to carry us again, and Rosemont, Ryan Taylor up in Bangor. We're, we're just like I said, I've been running a restaurant as well all summer, so. Last week, small seed. Oh yeah, that's the other, well yeah, that's a good point. Um, so Steve works with um, Maker Seed Vegetables, which is also in Hancock, and those are the people that do the dulse. And so for 20 years, we, probably more 20 years, we've been smoking dulse for Maker Seed Vegetables. As a matter of fact, yesterday they just dropped off, I think, 600 pounds to us. But they demand, now the thing with, with mango sea vegetables is they are organic. So in order for us to smoke for them, we had to get organic certification. So even though we couldn't get the FDA to finish all the paperwork, Mothka, main organic farmer, right? Um, they came through and we got our certification. But, and and that's, it's a pretty rigorous process, you know, the inspection and, and stuff. So, yeah, so we're, we're, we partnered up with them for their special projects. Yeah? Hey, everyone stretch.